Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it might be where you are out there. Welcome back to my live stream. This is a debut stream here on the Visual Studio channel. My name is Jeff Fritz. I go by the screen name C Sharp Fritz. And we're going to spend some time today learning about C Sharp. This is the first of a very long series <laughs> of, of videos, of streams that you can participate in where we're going to go over, we're going to get you started learning all about C Sharp. This is intended to be a beginner friendly talk radio like discussion. You're going to find archives of this over on the YouTube channel, but we're going to broadcast live. We're going to have our conversations right here on Twitch. Now, when I say beginner friendly, that means we're not going to talk about architecture. We're not going to talk about solid principles and dependency injection and the latest version of C Sharp and all the cool new features that are coming out. We'll eventually get to some of those topics. That's not the tone that we want to go through as part of this show. We want to talk about the things that help you get started. We want to talk about basic concepts. Why would you choose C Sharp? What, what does it give you? What, what are some of the features that I need to know just to get started writing? And how can I get started writing? What are, what are the things that I need to install and, and learn all about this great programming language that's available? So I see a bunch of friends over there in the chat room already. Let me say hello to Jean Valjean80. Good morning to you. Um, is that Ozer Sanal? Hello, Spined. Good to see you. Uh, M. Pulaski. Hello, Shy Sharp is here. John Calloway. Chris, is that Chris C119? Nope, sorry. Some of those commands that you normally find over on my Twitch channel, they're not running over here on the Visual Studio channel. We'll eventually have a bot running here that gets you running, gets you connected with all the features, that interactive features that you might expect to see here on a Twitch channel. We'll get it loaded up. We'll have, we'll have the panels below configured. And um, based on some of your feedback, we'll build it out appropriately. Justin Horner is here. M. Stu Fadeka. Hello, Yakoso. Good to see you. Schwami Streams. Schwami has. A, psh, a look at this. Schwami Streams is saying it right here. I do have. I I don't see it here. Let me get it loaded up real quick. Um, I do have featured chat running, so we can take a look and and highlight some of the comments from folks that are here in the Visual Studio chat. Schwami's got it right. Look at this. If you're here, you're about to learn C Sharp from the right guy. They named the... No, they didn't name the language after me. No, no. I... Okay, I get asked this question a bit. I took the screen name C Sharp Fritz. Why'd you take that name? So back in 2005, 2006, um, I started... I was I, I was a, a brash 20-something um, writing code and for a, a small company in... Um, I was doing things that I thought were were kind of breaking not just the project I was working on, but I was I was breaking into new places. I was doing things that were kind of out there. Um, I was very much a believer in the alt.net movement. And that was a movement of community folks around the .NET programming languages, C Sharp and Visual Basic, that that believed, hey, there's other ways to do things besides the way Microsoft prescribes things. So I was doing things that were kind of outside the box. So I started a blog called C Sharp on the Fritz, right? Playing off of my name. You see, you see how that works there? That was, that was kind of a thing. Um, <clears throat> um, right, where's that rim shot? There it is. So, um, when I, so I have the blog, and the blog is still out there. If you go to csharpfritz.com, that's my blog. It's been around for 15 years. Um, and when I, when I took that and I wanted to go to Twitter, that was too long of a name. So I dropped the on and the the, and it just became C Sharp Fritz. <clears throat> and that very much became a brand that I used a whole bunch of different places, including GitHub, YouTube, um, TikTok. TikTok? That's a thing, but mm, I, there's nothing on my TikTok. I have a TikTok, but there's nothing over there. 
Uh, <clears throat> let me see here. Um, good morning, M. Stu. Justin Horner. Frackberg. Good to see you. I see some friends here. Void Rose. Can more experienced programmers benefit from this? Um, perhaps we're not going to get to some of that content today that you're going to benefit, that experienced programmers would benefit from. Um, but we're going to have fun. We're going to learn together. Um, and this is intended to be talk radio format. I'm, I'm not sitting here, um, looking to, to answer and, and lecture the entire time. This is intended to be interactive. And I think you're going to see from how I'm structuring the content and how we deliver the content and how you can access the content after this video is over, you're going to be able to interact and, and learn and, um, have all of all of the materials available to you not to mention um as we're going along here you're going to be able to click through and try it out try some of the things that we're doing so this is the first of a very long series that's right uh a aps twitch that's right we're um these will be archived over on i believe it'll be on the dot net uh, YouTube channel, not the Visual Studio YouTube channel. I'll have specifics for you and announcements and links through from... We we have a show GitHub repository. I'll, I'll show you where that is and we'll um, we'll move forward and have a really good time together. It, look at this. It's beautiful and sunny out there in Philadelphia today. Can you believe it? Looking outside the... I'm, I'm stuck in the machine here, as it were. But outside in Philadelphia, it looks amazing. So, I hope you stick around. I hope you have a good time. Um, it, we're going to be telling jokes and, and, um, it always chat room. The AMA flag is on. The AMA tag is on the ask me anything tag. Please ask any questions you might have. Um, but we want to make sure that they are on topic questions outside of it. Questions about the latest Microsoft news questions about the latest version of visual studio. If that's not the topic we're working on, I'm not going to, I'm not going to answer those questions, but if we are, if it is a question around what it is we're working on, I'm happy to answer those questions along the way. Um, Digi says, in Germany, it's summer too. Weather is too nice to work. Yeah, you know what? Something to be said about being able to go outside and working outside. And working remotely means I, I could go outside and work out there. It's just, this is where the studio is here inside the machine. You know what I'm saying? I'm inside the machine, as it were. And, <clears throat> and I need to stick around here. So, um, okay, <clears throat> I think, uh, uh, I wanted to get some music playing. What, what music could I play? I'm going to play Harris Heller's, uh, synth wave. This is copyright, copyright free music that you can play on your YouTube channel. You can play on your Twitch channel. Um, it's great background music that you can listen to that is, uh, free for anybody to use anywhere. No license needed. And uh, it's kind of groovy, tech-focused, and we'll have this running in the background. Um, let's start somewhere down here. There we go. Thank you very much to Harris Heller. He runs the Alpha Gaming channel on YouTube, and Harris Heller here on Twitch for making some of this cool music available. See, um, uh, Natoki stuff, not going to answer that question. That's right out. That's outside of our content that we're going to discuss. So I want to get you in. I want to get you started. I want to get you pointed in the right direction with .NET. And that means we need to get you an install and we need to talk about why C Sharp. There's so many things that you can do with this great programming language. Buckle up, friends. Get ready. We're going to go on a, a tremendous... Um, this is going to be a tremendous series. Whole lot of content. I'm planning out writing a lot of a lot of content before I publish it here. I'm going to be doing a lot of prep work to make sure that we're very focused in our discussions that we have here on stream. Each one of these sessions will be about two hours. When it gets over to the YouTube channel, it might be edited down a little bit. We'll see how my friends at Channel 9 help out uh, as far as how much we're able to cut, how much we're able to reuse. And maybe we break out and put some of our questions out as as other short videos for folks to access we'll see how it goes and a lot of this depends on you i'm going to be running the polls here on on twitch a lot um because i want to make sure that 
that I'm meeting your needs, that, that we're discussing and getting things moving in the right direction for you. How's it going there? It's signalized. Good to see you. Focused on Twitch, says Freckberg. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, is that blood? Blood? <laughs> blood was taken. Welcome. Um, with a with a comment here, and and this is something that I think is um, kind of makes me a little depressed to hear someone ask. Well, I didn't know C sharp was still relevant. Oh, it's very very relevant. Um, there are millions of .NET developers out there. There are millions of applications deployed at enterprises, at on some of the biggest internet sites that you've seen. Some of the biggest games that you've played run on C-sharp. They're written with C-sharp. The Unity game engine is built with C-sharp. Folks use that to build games all the time right here on Twitch. And it's, it's freely available for anybody to use. Anybody can get started with C-sharp. Anybody can build with it. You don't have to pay exorbitant license fees. You don't have to pay runtime fees to anyone if you want to build and deploy a simple C-sharp application. When you want to deploy, though, to some platforms, those platforms may have a fee for their developers to get in, use their software development kits, and get started. So, depending on where you deploy to, it may, it may have a fee, but if you want to build a web application, if you want to build a desktop application, you want to build a console application, you want to build a service that runs behind the scenes, you can do all of that completely free. You want to deploy that out to a cloud service, to a hosting provider, you're going to have to pay those folks to be able to deploy and use their services. But if you want to deploy a mobile application, you're going to have to pay the mobile providers to get listed and, and use their stores. So there's a little bit of what you can and cannot do with C Sharp. It is very relevant in 2020. Um, the music that we're playing, this is from this is from Harris Heller's Synthwave royalty-free, license-free music that you can use right on Spotify. I am covering the language. I'm going to be covering the C-sharp language. We may at some point get into frameworks, but our focus is... I, thanks. Thank, you could download Visual Studio for Mac. Um, I'm not sure why that popped up. Let me get rid of some of these old ones here. There we go. All right. So, um, let me see here. He uh, a couple more questions and comments here. Um, is that let me, Maru and Neber uh, says hello from Morocco. Well, hello to you out there. Thank you so much for tuning in from morocco can we um can we have a real quick sound off where folks are from in the chat room let me know drop a line with with country region that you're dialing in from you're watching today um and uh highlight some of the places folks are connecting from um natoki stuff says vb is the one that isn't relevant there are a lot of folks using visual basic visual basic is an extremely stable language that that is not going to be changing significantly going forward. It, it's, it's done, it's feature complete, and they'll be maintaining the language going forward. You're going to continue to get great support for Visual Basic, and you're going to be able to use it with .NET 5, with .NET Core, with .NET Framework, and we'll talk about what each one of those things are. It'll, it'll still be available for you to use. Um, we are talking about C Sharp today. Um, C Sharp is still being improved. Lots of investment into C Sharp to make sure that it is a modern and um, it, ma it maintains as a modern and, and very cool language for you to use. Um, you, you'd get into mono game if you weren't so in love with Blazor, says Chris C119. Well, thank you. Appreciate the compliments on that. Um... Uh, Chris C is from New Jersey. We've got Tampa, Alberta, Canada, Denmark joining in, West Germany in Europe. Very cool. Charlotte, North Dakota, Washington, Silicon Valley, 
Hop in the cloud, loves Blazer. I, I like Blazer pretty much, too. Thank you so much. Utah is here. Marrakesh, welcome in. Istanbul, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Ozer Sanol, good to see you. Ozer, is that Ozer Sanol 82? Let me know. I want to make sure I pronounce all of your uh, stream names, your, your screen names properly here. Northern Virginia is where the giggles is. Very cool. Um, we're not... Um, from Colombia, but living in Melbourne, Australia. Good evening to you, SQ, uh, SQSW uh, Payas. Let me know how to pronounce that. Net Cody's is here. Uh, ha ha, top swag code. Ha ha. Oh, I see what you did there. Yes, Visual Basic is still very much rele relevant. Stockport in the UK. Blazer, Mr. Magoo. Good to see you. Bosnia and Herzegovina. Welcome. Um... In the Netherlands, we are just starting. Windward High from Nigeria. Welcome. Thank you for tuning in. From Delhi is where Diva73 is. Very cool. I, gosh, I really appreciate everybody tuning, tuning in. Um, uh, Natoki stuff. No, is that no Toki stuff? Do I like F sharp? Yes, I do. I do like F sharp, but I have a preference for, for C sharp. I think for everybody, when you start programming, you're going to find programming languages that you like, some that you don't like, and some that just kind of fit like a glove with around your brain, right? Uh, uh, David Henmeyer Hansen, the, the original author, the inventor of Ruby on Rails, refers to when he started writing Ruby on Rails, it felt like a glove for his brain. And, and that's what C-sharp really feels like to me. It just fits right. It fits with how I think. And so I prefer C-sharp. I... I've, I've learned a little bit of F-sharp. I'd like to spend some more time learning F-sharp. I've learned Python. I've learned HTML, JavaScript, other programming languages. And those are, they're, they're great. They have their purposes. They have their own strengths and weaknesses. But for me, I like C-sharp. Um, I do not want to see any kind of, um, the chat room, I do not want to see any kind of uh, uh, competition between or, or uh, bragging about one programming language or framework versus another. And ADO Pilot, I am not answering questions that are off topic today. We're staying focused on learning C Sharp. And if you want to talk, if you want to ask a question about that, happy to cover that tomorrow on my stream. You can find that over on the C Sharp Fritz channel right here on Twitch. So let's stay focused. Let's get into <laughs> the giggles. <laughs> Well, that's that's one way to describe it. That that's a little over the top, a little bit over the top. It's a nice programming language. I'm thrilled to be able to to say that I work with some of the the incredibly smart people that that build the programming language. I mean, some people they invent a programming language and they call it a day, and they go, "Wow, that was really cool. We built a programming language." Um, but uh, Anders Heilsberg, the, the gentleman who, who invented C Sharp, he didn't stop at one. He made four. That's pretty impressive stuff when you think about that. Um, we're not even going to get into .NET for the desktop. So we will, we will get around all of these. Uh, Turbo Pascal, Delphi, C Sharp, and TypeScript are the four programming languages that our friend Anders Hausberg wrote. Maybe at, at some point, um, I'm, I'm sure we're going to have some of the folks from, from the C Sharp team, from the .NET team join us here. Um, maybe we'll have uh, Anders join us at some point. I, the, the folks that currently run the programming language, a gentleman named Mads Torgerson is the lead uh, language designer for C Sharp. Does a tremendous job. He's, he hangs out on, tw on Twitter. You can find him um, every now and again, talking about some of the cool features that are coming along. And you'll see Mads giving presentations at big conferences like Microsoft Build and Microsoft Ignite, introducing new features to the language. It's signalized. Please don't continue with the bragging or I will have to, um, I will have to time you out. Okay. Um, at some point at Puji, um, Lambda Expressions will be covered. We're not going to get anywhere close to that today. We're going to start at the very, very beginning. We're going to get, well, let's get over to the code. Let's go head over to what that looks like. And we can start 
we can start looking at this is the website that you get to when you navigate to dot dot net this is the place to get all things dot net so if you go to that URL I just dropped in chat you'll be able to do, get some information about how to get started right you'll get here and all the cool things that you can do with dot net free cross-platform open source but uh, Fritz you were talking to me about C sharp why dot net okay here's here's the thing there's there's a framework there's a runtime and then there's a programming language okay so the programming language we're going to be using for this is C sharp there are other programming languages that are part of the .NET platform and that can target the .NET platform. But when you compile your c -sharp code, it turns into code that works on a .NET runtime. And that runtime runs on all kinds of different places like you see here. It can run for the web, mobile devices, desktop. You can build microservices with the runtime. Internet of Things, cloud applications, machine learning, game development, all these different runtimes and different frameworks that are available that your programming content, right? You're going to write a program that uses a framework that will compile down and run on one of these runtimes on those target locations. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool, right? That's a lot of different places that you can go with it. Now I see some pretty good questions in here that are leaning towards where I want to go. Um, so Notoki stuff asks, what's the difference between mono and .NET? Oh, you might hear it referred to as mono as well. So um, when, when .NET was originally released back in 2001, um, it was made available from Microsoft as a Windows only unified application development um, series of tools and um, a, a fellow named Miguel Diacaza wanted to take that series of tools that were made available as standards and, and take those standards and re-implement them on Linux and um, that's what the Mono project was was the re-implementation of .NET on Linux using effectively a clean room approach right did not have any of the source code wrote it all from hand to adhere to the specification that was published so re-implementing the c sharp compiler re-implementing all of the framework things that you needed to write to a console to listen to a, a web request to interact with the network to write files to disk all these things that you need to do with a programming language and as time advanced and things changed and and the industry and technologies changed, it became clear that Mono had a really interesting place where you could compile things and get it running on a mobile device, on an iPhone, on an Android phone. And, and the Mono open source framework remained out there and they started building libraries on top of it, frameworks on top of it that eventually became Xamarin for iOS and Xamarin for Android. So Mono is the free open source implementation of .NET that compiles with an ahead of time um, approach, right? An ahead of time um, technique where everything that you compile gets all the way compiled down to assembly, right? It'll run natively on the machine where .NET code that you compile will run on top of a runtime that hands off the operating instructions to the PC. So Mono is being used by the folks at Unity. It's being used behind the scenes in Xamarin. It's being used um, as part of the Blazor project and the Blazor framework to run on top of WebAssembly. So that's a little bit of the difference between runtimes, frameworks, and the programming language and how we get into .NET here. So let me continue scrolling through some of these questions that we have here. Void Rose asks a, another valid question here. Let's bring this up. How's .NET support in Linux? So since 2015, um, 
the folks from Microsoft in in coordination with the .NET Foundation um, have been working on a version of .NET frameworks called .NET Core. And .NET Core runs natively on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So you have very, very good support for .NET to build web applications, um, console applications, services on Linux. There is not currently support from the .NET Foundation for desktop application support on Linux. That's something that we're looking for help from the Linux communities to help build that user interface framework so that it can be done. Um, but there are some ways to do that with Xamarin Forms and get it running on Mac and Linux as well. So, um, thank you for the question, Void Rose. Appreciate that. But that's that will get you into .NET Core. Um, you can make IoT projects that run on Raspberry Pi? Yep, absolutely. All right. Um, Adil518, this is a good question as well. Let's talk about this. What are some of the prerequisites to learn C Sharp? For this series of videos, for, for, this, um, for this stream series, I have no prerequisites for you. You don't have to install anything. You don't have to go and learn something. We're going to talk through everything at a very beginner level and give you some resources here on the web that you can interact with and build C Sharp code to learn a little bit about it without installing a thing. We'll get to a point where you're going to, um, you're going to want to install some tools locally because we're going to get into building some of these types of projects um, and you're going to want to have a little bit more control running locally for those. And there are other tools and features out there that allow you to build and do more um let you build and do more um, inside the browser thinking particularly of code spaces you can work with more on that as it develops over the next few months that's not a tool that we're going to discuss um, here all right a little bit of tea getting going here um hey how's it going there uh, black eye good to see you and roosh um let's talk about unit testing frameworks on on my channel I want to stay beginner focused on uh, on C sharp here. All right. So, um, so I just went to dot dot net, and there's all kinds of information here about all the things that you can use, and some of the some of the customers out there that are using it. And um, there are around um, some of these some of the enterprises that use dot net. A lot of enterprises that use dot net. Um, they don't like disclosing their technology stack. Um, they, they see it as proprietary and uh, proprietary information that they want to protect. They and uh, that's okay. That's their choice. Nobody says you have to go and declare. Here's what I'm using. But there are some folks that don't like to do that. So, all right. You can download here to jump right in and download tools to get you started. I'm going to click over here to the Get Started. And there's some great videos that are available for you to download download tools, get it installed on your machine. That's great. Um, whether you're on Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, you can click through. And the .NET Core 101 series is here from my friends uh, Scott Hanselman and Kendra Havens. You're welcome to watch that. Um, but we want to we want to talk about and get get some discussion going on here and be able to talk about some of these things. So I'm not going to be going down the hello world in ten minutes discussion here. I'm going to be doing everything in the browser with you. Um, you're welcome to download if you'd like. You can download here. You don't need to install a big um, integrated development environment. You don't need to install. Visual Studio, Visual Studio for Mac. You don't need to install Visual Studio Code if you don't want to. You can. It'll make you very productive because there's all kinds of enhancement tools in there to make your editing experience amazing. But you can run on the command line. You can download just the SDK right here for .NET Core to get started. Now, there are different frameworks available, right? 
.NET Core, .NET Framework. .NET Framework is the version of .NET that's been around um, since 2001, so almost 20 years, and runs only on Windows. For new applications, we encourage folks to use .NET Core. That'll allow you to build for Windows, Mac, and Linux, compile and put things inside of a Docker container. It'll also let you build web services, web applications, um, system services. It'll let you build desktop applications for Windows using Windows Forms or WPF, the Windows Presentation Foundation frameworks. So you have a lot of different options between these two just to get started. So we encourage you to try .NET Core if you want to go through and download. But for the purposes of this, we're going to go through and we're actually going to do work in the browser using um, something called .NET Interactive. And that's going to allow us to use Jupyter Notebooks to write some documentation, write some code, and let them interact with each other, try some things out without breaking anything without being wrapped up in all the formal nonsense of building a project and building an application. So, um, should be real easy for us to get started. We can talk more about installing and managing the SDK another time. I want to get in and talk about, get right into nuts and bolts and get started with some of this. Get started writing, writing some simple code. All right, chat room. So, all right, I'm just looking here. .NET Core doesn't work for you. Why doesn't it work with you, for you? Let's go, let's do this. So I have a, I have a GitHub. Um, I'm known for dyeing my beard funny colors. Um, that was a drawing from my friend, um, He's Reverend Geek out on Twitter. That is David. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on David's last name. He's Reverend Geek on Twitter. He is. Oh my gosh. And um, I'm, I'm blanking on it. My apologies. Uh, David Neal. Thank you, Shwami. Um, and did a drawing. I had a purple beard for the Visual Studio 2019 launch. Purple is more my color. Well, thank you. That's very kind. Um, so. If you go to my GitHub, github.com C Sharp Fritz, here is where you're going to find our um, our show repository that we're going to go through here. C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. Click into there, and this is where you're going to find all the source code. There's the link for you. All the source code, all the notes. Um, I mean, I'm even going to build out an FAQ here as we go along. But you're going to be able to get started in your browser with some of the content that we've built and we have here. Now, I've configured and I'm running this with Jupyter Notebooks. And I've already got a Jupyter Notebook running locally here. If you want to jump in, you want to check out the notebooks, I'm they're inside this folder and you can download and run this if you have Jupyter Notebooks and .NET Interactive running locally. I don't want you to go and install that locally if you don't already have it. But... If you do want to run it, you do want to follow along, you can click Launch Binder here. And it will open up using the Binder web application and run right in your browser. So this is going to start up and eventually everybody will be able to jump in and you'll be able to see exactly what's going on with this first notebook that I've built to get us pointed in the right direction, get us started. Um, I, I've started a wiki page here and we will build this out. Like I said, here's an FAQ. As, as more questions come up that, are, that we frequently have, I'll get them loaded into here so you have something to reference going forward. If there's any um, issues, if there, when we get into our sample projects, if, if we put some stuff out there and you want to suggest features, we'll have issues and pull requests that we'll get into at a later time. So for right now, I want to show you where I started with this first Jupyter Notebook. This is using Jupyter Lab. It's a way for you to interact with and, like I said, write a little bit of markdown, write a little bit of code, and have it interact. John Calloway is here. Good to see you. Um, a couple more questions here. Folks interested in the cap, 
Um, this is a cap with the Visual Studio icon on it that I made for the Visual Studio 2019 launch. Um, this is not available from the folks at Microsoft. This is um, literally I went to my local embroidery shop and had them make a hat. And what's, Im what's important is you see you got to wear the hat because it gets a little blue underneath here, right? Yeah, got to... So, keep the lid on, right? Keep the blue in check. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, Wandy says Microsoft should make Visual Studio hats. I kind of agree with you, um, but it's not my decision. We, we have um, strongly encouraged the folks in the marketing department, hey, we, we'd really like to... We'd really like some of that, but... So... Um, yes, you do need the SDK and the runtime for an application to run, but if you install the, if you download the SDK, the, to the question in chat, if you download the .NET Core SDK, it will install the runtime for you as well. So, I see a couple of folks saying that they would, that they would absolutely be interested in buying one. Very cool. And friends, um, if you... Please, if if there's things that you want to remember, if there's video parts of what's going on here that, that you want to be able to share on social media, hit that clip button. There's a little clip button right over here. It's right next to the closed captioning button. Click that and um, feel free to make clips, share it on social media about what's going on here. Let the world know that we're having some fun learning about C Sharp together. All right, let me go back over. So if you've opened up, if you've clicked through Binder, you should have a document that looks like this when you click into the notebooks folder. And, right, so there's a launcher here. You can build your own notebooks if you'd like. But um, if you click into the notebooks folder, here's the first one called 0101. So um, it's the first month. It's the first session that we're doing. And, I, and I'm just calling it first session to, for today. And here's the tab with the content that we're going to be talking about. Now, we've already had some folks ask questions that that I <laughs> I was going to describe and answer in the first paragraph or two here in this first section. Huh? Look at that. It, it's like I knew you were going to ask those things, and I already loaded them up there, right? We, we already had a question about Mono. There it is. And about what a .NET framework. So, Windows Forms, ASP.NET, Xamarin for iOS, Blazor. Those are various frameworks that you can build towards and use with C sharp okay I, I want to write some code let's get into writing some code I want to write some code let's do this let's get in and and get started let's let's break some things you know what I'm saying that was a point um let me pull down the music just a smidge there we go because, darn it, I want you to be able to hear some of those funny sound effects. All right. So, it may, yeah, it may take a little bit. We're, oh yeah, right, and that's, that's one of the things that I want to make sure you're comfortable about here as we're going along is by doing some things in the browser like this, we're going to break things. Absolutely. And I, we don't care. Okay, it broke. No harm, no foul. It didn't crash our machine. It didn't. Um, it, it nobody's nobody's information got lost. We didn't hit anybody's credit card or anything. It's just in the browser. Who cares? This is taking a little bit to launch. If you're out there, but it will eventually pop up. And you didn't dox yourself. Thank you, Mr. Smoothie. That's the important thing. Don't dox yourself. Learn from me and don't dox yourself because I tend to do it a bit. Just a bit. It happens every now and again, and you don't want to do that. Okay? There you go. Um, and from here, you can click into that first Jupyter Notebook, and it'll open. It won't look quite the same because it's in the Jupyter Notebook interface, but uh, I'm over here running locally with Jupyter Lab, and you see I'm running locally. Any changes that we make, any additional code that we write here, I will save and I will update and they'll be available 
in the uh, in the GitHub repository, and eventually the notebook that's running out there will be updated with um, because it has a build cycle it goes through. Will be updated with that additional content. So if you're watching the recording, this will be updated, and and it's it probably doesn't look like this anymore because we've added some additional stuff later in the session. Yeah. Okay. We're going to talk about types, keywords, and operators today. I want to get you in and, and get you familiar with a little bit of just the basics. Just enough to get you going, okay, this isn't too bad. I know what's going on here. So, we we already had this discussion about what C-sharp is. Um, what you do need to know is that when you write a typical C sharp program, you need to define how that programming language, how the framework it interacts with, and any other references that you may want to bring in, references that let you interact with the web or, or some other service, or maybe you've written some business logic that, that you want to put into a different program, be able to reference and consume that. You're going to need to define a project file. And you see project files in other programming languages. You see, right, you see a package JSON file with Node and JavaScript, right? And you see other, um, other files out there that describe how to compile, how to structure your content. They may call them a manifest, um, but it's basically the same thing. In C Sharp, we'll create a CS proj file. Um, I double clicked on that, and I shouldn't have. We'll create a CS proj file, right? Some project name dot CS proj, and it'll contain all the things in it that describe how the project runs. Um, for this, I, I want to make sure you know what that is so that you don't get lost. You don't see this thing and go, I don't need that. I'm writing C sharp content. The CS proj file, don't worry about it. It You have tools that will help you manage that content and manage the structure of your application. Now, most C sharp files end with a .cs extension. Let's write that in here. Let's make sure that we got that. Um, all uh, C sharp files um, carry a .cs, right? Uh, file extension by default. Okay. There we go. So .cs for C Sharp is a file that contains C Sharp programmable content, right? It has some language content in there that you're going to work with. Now, th there are two or three rules right off the bat that you need to know about C Sharp syntax that, that are really the rules of the road here. There's a semicolon at the end of every statement statement. There's things that are block level interactions that you might do. An if statement that you might run into, right? An if block level um, interaction. A, a for loop you might write. A while loop that go do these things and, and repeat over it. Um, those are different. A statement, a one line statement, assigning a variable. Um, doing some calculation or something you need to put a semicolon at the end of those one-line statements. Um, and Tony Davis with a, with a comment here. Statically typed versus strongly typed. These are statically typed. This is a statically typed language. Um, and you can get into and do some strongly typed things later. We'll get into that. But statically typed means that every variable, every object that we interact with has a type there is some sort of a type right a type reference that it's going to use and we'll talk about types here in just a second so semicolons at the end of everyone comments real easy forward slash forward slash everything after that is a comment you see here and forward slash star use these slash asterisk fencing Right, everything between slash asterisk and asterisk slash across multiple lines are commented out. They're not referenced. The the compiler, right, that piece of the, that program that takes our C sharp code and turns it into a program, 
ignores this. It, it effectively throws that out and doesn't do anything with it. Okay? Now, everything in C-sharp is an object. Uh, comments are not an object. Comments are ignored. So, if we get into and we start talking about objects in C-sharp, this is an object-oriented, statically typed language. So, we have types that we need that come by default with the language. And I even linked off here to the documentation for built-in types for the C-sharp language. And when you look at some of these built-in types, they're just numbers. Eh, Boolean, Boolean is true, false, but byte, uh, signed byte, character, right? A, a single character, right? And those are letters and special characters that you might have on your keyboard. Uh, decimal, double, float. Decimal, double, and float are, um, those are real numbers, right? That have numbers after the decimal place. Um, integer, unsigned integer, uh, long, unsigned long, short, unsigned short. Those are integral numbers. They don't have values after the decimal. Um, those, you're going to be able to go a lot larger in the number that you can store in those types. And whether they're signed or unsigned, you might be able to store negative numbers or positive numbers or just positive numbers, depending on which one you use. Uh, that's right. Is that is that Mr. Fos? Is that how you pronounce that? Um, they're all inheriting from system object. That's right. So there is, and it's not listed here, but there is a object type that all of these inherit from. It, it's the base type for everything inside of C-sharp is an object. Everything is an object, so there is an object type that everything belongs to. Now, that means that you can generically refer to everything as an object because everything descends from an object. Everything inherits from it. And we'll get into object inheritance probably in our next episode together. So, um... AP, APS Twitch asks um, about a Jupyter Lab, how to interact. Um, so when you're over here in the notebook, if you double click, um, it'll turn into the markdown, right? And what, we're actually going to do a little bit of this um, as we're going along and we get to some of the code that's in here. So... These are some of the built-in numeric types. There are some other, right? These are also value types. Value types and reference types are two different ways that .NET stores things in memory, okay? Value types are stored in what's called the stack. And the stack is a very fast access area of memory. Reference types are stored on the heap. And when they go on the heap, it takes a little bit longer to interact with them. For our human eyes, you're not gonna see a significant difference when you interact with them. But all of these at some point get garbage collected. You don't have to destroy these types. You don't have to say, I'm not using that anymore. It will eventually be collected by a garbage collector when it sees that these things are no longer being referenced and the garbage collector will free up that memory. There's a comment, there's a question here from far too long. Um, and this is a valid question. Why isn't C Sharp compiled to native code directly instead of requiring a runtime on the target host? It's what has always kept me off that language. So, you can compile it to native code. There's a second step you can do. The reason that uh, initially .NET went um, and compiled just to what they call um, intermediate language, right? which is a way for you to build code that will run in a bunch of different places wherever the .NET runtimes are installed. And that's what far too long is referencing. Um, and that means you end up with a much smaller deployment. You don't have to deploy tons and tons of things because you're not carrying all of these things that already run well, initially, it was just on Windows everywhere. Um, there are uh, there are options to what do what we call NGEN, 
to native generate code and it'll actually compile with that native code and make that entirely available to you. You can do that with .NET Framework. With .NET Core, you can publish and deliver those pieces of the framework that are appropriate, the runtime, for that target uh, operating system you might be sending things to. And, and you can do compile directly to that native code with, um, with Xamarin as well. And you're gonna see a little bit of that start to happen with .NET 5. And when we start to cross and we bring together all these different .NET technologies. So it was intended as a, as a speed thing. Keep down the size of the application, be able to deploy because everybody has .NET Framework running. .NET Framework is a part of Windows. It'll always be on Windows going forward. So if you only need to build things that interact with the file system, well, there's already stuff to do that. Installed and running and native on Windows. So we can keep that a lot smaller without deploying those extra things. And that was part of the decision behind that. This is a very exciting time to be using .NET. Lots happening, lots growing and coming together. And we, we really feel like this is um, a renaissance for .NET developers. You're welcome far too long. Thank you for the question. Very much appreciate questions coming in from, from the viewers. And we want to make sure we answer your questions. Oh, that's some good tea. All right. So... Those were our value types. We have reference types, right? There, there's our object. And there's a string. A string is a reference type because a string is actually made up of a collection of characters, right? And that collection we call an array, right? An array is just a one-dimensional matrix. It's a one-dimensional collection of characters. And there's also dynamic. Dynamic is a, is a funny thing in the C-sharp language. We're not going to get into dynamic for a bit here, but know that you can create a dynamic object, a dynamic type, and interact with it. But for getting started, we're going to put dynamic to the side, and we're, we're not going to talk about it yet. We may talk about it in a few weeks. It's not something we need to get into. Let's stick with just these static types and get into these. Just, so. All right. So we can declare our variables like we now you see each one of these things here with the number next to it. The, this is code running inside the Jupyter Notebook. And you're welcome to click into it and change this. We declare our variable types with the type in front, right? We declare our variables with the variable type first and then the name of the variable. So. I created an integer, a 32-bit integer. That's what the INT type is. And you can go through the documentation and see the exact memory allocated for each one of those types. And it's int i. And great. That that doesn't really do anything. I can also create a, a double, right? A double whatever. Um, right? I can create, right, character uh, and whatever. Okay? And if I tell it to output what that thing is, uh, there's nothing there. You've declared a variable. There, it isn't anything. In fact, it has the initial value of zero. We can initialize and set a value on that variable. So we can not only declare the variable, but set a value into it by using an equal statement at declaration time. So int i equals 10, and I, I put the variable on a line by itself, and the Jupyter Notebook knows to output what that is. So int i, and it, right, I didn't declare what it is. By default, it's zero. If I change this to j, and I run that, j is zero as well. Uh, if I look at the character, the character is just the empty string. There's nothing there. Nope, we're not getting into dynamic. Well, Caparino, we, we'll get into that a little bit later. Typecasting, we can talk about typecasting. That's probably a good a good thing to talk about here. So um, let, let's get to typecasting. I'm gonna, I wanna pin that topic. We'll get back to it. Um, let's jump into that. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, right here. We'll, we'll talk about typecasting right there. 
and I'll write some content to go with that. And uh, we'll write some code and just drop it in here. Um, okay, so real, uh, oh, the var keyword was next. So, right, we declared things with int, double, car, those various types. Well, if you're assigning a type, you don't have to go and specify, here's the type that I'm defining each time. You can use the var keyword for a little bit of syntactic sugar. It's not required, but when you use the var keyword like I am here, it tells the compiler, go figure out what the, what the type is that's being assigned on the right side, and that's the variable type of this thing here, okay? And you don't have to make your variables one character name, right? You can make them as long as you'd like. Um, and reference them elsewhere in your program. Um, Caparino didn't know Python can execute C-sharp code. Well, this is a Jupyter Notebook running .NET Interactive. For those of you that might be interested... Um, .NET Interactive. So this is running a, no. This is running a kernel um, behind the scenes and you can install these into your, uh, into your Jupyter Notebook configuration so that it runs not just Python, but it runs other programming languages, other tools, other visualizers so that you can use more than just Python with a Jupyter Notebook. So you can learn more about how that's configured right there with that link to the .NET Interactive project. So. VAR lets the compiler infer the type versus the explicit declaration. That's right, Tony. Um, so I'm explicitly declaring it here. If I use VAR, the compiler will infer it and, and compile and will put the appropriate type in the code that it generates, right? It, it does a little bit of look ahead. So you're not actually, um, th there is no performance hit for using var versus int. It's strictly a preference. It's strictly, we call it syntactic sugar. It makes your coding experience a little bit easier. Um, Wandi says var is dangerous. It's always best to be explicit if possible. It's optional. You it, folks can choose to use it. You can actually set up um, various editors to indicate whether var is allowed or not allowed in your source code. You can have it. You can have it raise an error, right? It says, "Sorry, we don't allow var in our source code." I like var. Um, because I think it's something that makes it very flexible when I'm declaring my types, um, and the compiler will find if there's a if there's a bad type reference later. So it is a preference. All of this is about is about freedom to choose how you want to interact with your code. Uh, similarly, um, space can be freely used throughout your C# -sharp program. You don't have to always have the same number of spaces before these I can I can put spaces there uh, I can put tabs it doesn't matter it all works okay so um, you have options you have freedom to choose and run your code write your code so that it it looks the way you want to um, a, a company I used to work for we would define our our variables. Um, so here's maybe var i equals 10, var some really long variable name equals, uh, I don't know, nine, doesn't matter. But we would see that, and in order to make it look a little bit nicer, we would add some space in here so that these all lined up. And you could look down and see there's my variable names on the left and all my variable assignments, initialization values were lined up with equal statements nicely in my code. And that's okay. That works just fine, right? I'm hitting control enter after I click in here and update some code. You can see 
Karnak in the top left corner is showing you what keys I click, I, I type to affect my interactions here. So, um, let me go back up here into in Syntax 101, Comment Syntax, um, everything in C Sharp. Um, let's also put in here um, Syntax 101. And let me also put in here a, a quick statement. Um, uh, C Sharp is not uh, space sensitive. Um, and we also should know C Sharp um, is case sensitive. Okay, and I'll I'll add some text around that later. So, right, we named our variables i, j, and c. Here, int i equals 10. It, it is case sensitive. If I try to reference i here, I, i doesn't exist, right? It needs to be the same casing, right? So, some really long variable name here, right? Um, down here, some really, in it. do I get, there you go. You even get type ahead completion in right there you go and it shows nine so you need to make sure you have the correct casing right if if i get that wrong that doesn't exist so type ahead right the the type ahead feature right i'm i'm hitting tab and it's letting me um right uh tab it's automatically completing it for me. I hit enter and it completes it here in the Jupyter Notebook. In other editors, Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio, Rider, um, your choice, right? The, the accelerator keys to activate the type of head completion may be different. So let me take a look there. Um, Tony Davis finds VAR increasing signal to noise. Um, it's easier to read. Okay. Um, shouldn't you write code snippets as you would write code? Well, we're not talking about code snippets today. So, um, no, we're not going to talk about that Moshiko. That is way complicated. We're not getting into, into efficiency and complicity today. We want to stay simple. This is for beginners. Next is this concept of real literals. And this is something that folks actually, folks forget. Folks don't use that frequently. So there are suffixes you can put behind numbers, D, F, or M, that will force a number to be either a double, a float, or a decimal, right? The D is already taken by decimal. So they move to M and M is the decimal way to reference that so um every variable every variable is an object so even though i've declared this number is 4d i'm saying hey this is the number four but make it a double i can put a method at the end of that variable reference dot get type get the type for this and because i don't have anything around it Jupyter Notebooks is going to report what that type is. So 4D is a double. If I change this to an F and I run that, now it says single. It's a float of single precision. Okay. And if I change this to an M, it's a decimal. Okay. So it's it's coercing. It's the coercing that type it's figuring out and interpreting here's the code that's on the right side of that assignment and and we're explicitly saying that four is a decimal with the the suffix of an m turn that into turn that number variable into a decimal um physitronic with a question when you use var, does it behave like a global variable in JavaScript? So um, global variables like you have in JavaScript 
are are within the scope of the page, right? Or the scope of um, the application that they're running within. We're going to talk about scopes as we get into classes and interfaces. Uh, I think that's going to be next week. We're going to get into classes and interfaces. We'll talk about that. They, var is private to the block that it's in. Notice I said block, not method. But within, you can also have var run within within an if block, within a for block or a, a while block. Those block level statements that say, here's a collection of code that I want you to execute in this scenario. Um, within there, you can run a var and it's only within that scope. It's only available inside that block or in a method. A method is a block as well. If you declare it inside the method, it's only available inside the method. And we can create variables outside of there that do have wider scope, that are more easily available across our entire application. Thank you for the question, Phys Physitronic. Appreciate that. That's right, Sir Yonston. Purely syntactic sugar. You don't need to use it. It doesn't it doesn't do anything special for the machine. It doesn't trigger some secret method that runs behind the scenes. No, no. It's just there for humans to be able to read and see, oh, here's my here's my variable declarations, var, 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 var. Because if I did make these, right, if I did make these a little bit more than, than var, right, um, if I had in here um, string foo, right and i've got to use spaces to write and this is uh something over here well now everything that i did to try and get this lined up isn't lined up over here also right and you can use string like that but right now if i want to get everything lined up now i gotta right put some of these over here and something like this and put this and you could do that that might be nice that may work well for you but right oops oops fat fingers right that looks really nice right and it's strictly syntactic sugar <laughs> foo and bars some of the worst things that happen in programming yeah yeah can you call vars over the scope asks moshiko I'm not sure what you mean by vars over the scope. If you declare scope for something, you need to declare the type explicitly. We'll get into that. We'll get into that. But I'm right now. I just want to declare variables within with within a, a little bit of um, a little bit of interaction with variables here inside of the Jupyter notebook. We'll talk about scope later. Like I said, scopes, cla uh, classes, interfaces. We'll talk about those next time. Um, would I advise the use of... Wandi asks, would I advise the use of var over specific data type? Um, I prefer the use of var over specific data type. You don't have to. It's strictly a preference. Just like spaces versus tabs. Strictly a preference. Use what makes you happy. Your choice. Um, ah, I see. Moshiko asks, clarifying about, if I have a var within one scope and you're inside of some other scope, can you bounce back and forth? No. Var is private to that area, that, er that block that it's been declared in can't be accessed outside of it. Hey, Excite, good to see you. Um, Physitronic, we will talk about enumerable in the future, yes. Um, yes, Tech Team 12, you can use Ju uh, C Sharp in Jupyter Labs. So, um, will the notes be on GitHub? Yes, there, we have a repository for the show that'll always be updated, that we are going to fill out you can get to the notebook there. You can click to launch the binder right there and you can get into the Jupyter Notebook. There's instructions on the .NET Interactive page. I should put an entry here. Um, let me take that as a line item here. Let's add some notes. 
Um, add reference to .NET Interactive. Um, um, add links to the README for information about getting started with .NET Interactive and uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter, the, the, the whole .NET Interactive thing, um, this is documentation. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it like that. Uh, the the Jupyter Notebooks .NET Interactive. This was a project that my friend Maria Nagaga spent a lot of time working on to to get across, make sure that it was easier for folks to teach and interact with um, .NET without installing anything. Right? You can do this on your tablet. You can do this on your phone if you'd like. And if you're doing it on if you're doing it on your phone. I suggest getting a Bluetooth keyboard wire up to your phone so you can do that. You could do that. And it'd be really cool. Um, yes, this is a very new series, um, L. Lehman. Um, it'll all be available on the .NET YouTube channel uh, later on. You had an introduction to algorithms course and you never used the var keyword. Var was introduced, I thought it was... .NET 3.5. That was about 2008. That was introduced. Um, so it's been around. Physitronic, yes, my keyboard does have... Um, it has cherry blue switches in it. Yep. Um, any preference to Jupyter Lab over LinkPad? I can do it in the browser and deploy these and make them available for anybody to interact with. When I'm done with with what we're working on here on my local copy of this. I'll add some more text to this and I will update the publicly available notebook for anybody to be able to interact with. And particularly those of you out there that are watching on YouTube, you're going to see the publicly available version of the notebook um, updated with all the content here that we finished during this session. Okay, good. Next steps. So let's talk about um, typecasting. And um, I'll have to add some text here around what typecasting is. So I'm going to open a block here and let's let's talk about casting things from from one type to another, right? Um, if I have an integer, right, that which is a whole number, and I want to make it into a decimal because I want to be able to, I want to be able to divide, right? And I'm going to have some decimal remainder on it, or, um, right? I want to, I want to t take a number and turn it into a string, right? I created a string here by in, in closing that in quotes. I can, I also, right? I can make a, um, let's do it down here. Eh, no. Um, I created a character C here. Um, let me see. Let's add another block. No, no, no. Um, right. If I create a character, right, you can set a character, right? String is in double quotes. You can set a character with a single quote and that will allocate that character. All right. Um, <laughs> let's say display, right? And there we go. Nine display that display is a, is a feature of the Jupyter notebook kernel to display some value and C is the character C. I can't put mul multiple characters in here. Um, right. I can't, I, that doesn't work too many characters in a char character literal. A character is one character. Okay and you enclose it in single quotes. Single quotes, double quotes are very important in, um, in C Sharp. The YouTube channel is youtube.com, that is .net, D-O-T-N-E-T, -E you'll find it over there when we publish. You can define an int by a decimal and by put that result and define it well, hang on, let's, let's talk about that. There you go. 
right? Um, so if we have an integer, right? Um, right, uh, let's call this uh, value A, right? We, and we make this 10, right? Um, if we have another integer and we call this value B and we make this um, five, right? Um, no, hang on. If I wanna take 10 and turn it into a decimal, right? Uh, uh, let's call this value B, right? I would, I can assign by doing something like that, but I'm not going to get the same thing out of it. It's 10, but it's kind of forcing its way over there. If I go the other way around, right? It's kind of forcing, interpreting and saying, well, I can make that into a decimal, but there's also size limits to these. If I turn this around the other way, you can't convert a decimal to an integer because it has leftovers, right? It's got things to the right of the decimal place, so it doesn't know what to do with that. You can force the issue to convert by putting inside a parentheses before it the name of the type you want it, you want the compiler to convert to. I'm saying, hey, I want to force, I want to explicitly convert from an integer to a decimal. Now, right, let me, let's put another, right, let's do that again the other way around here. Right, int, um, and we'll make these down here, value C and value D. I didn't spell display right, did I? Um, right, and if I do that interaction, it it works, but if I, uh, let's copy this. So you've got both of these lines here. Um, force the conversion, um, of the uh, value C to uh, int with the right int markup uh, modifier, let's call it, right? So there you go. You can't explicitly do that conversion, but if you do it that way, it does work, all right? So this is called up here where it's able to say, uh, that's supposed to be a decimal. Um, <laughs> right. Um, I need to rerun. Yep. Um, this is called implicit conversion because decimal can be implied. It can be implicitly converted. Okay. Yep, value D isn't declared. Good. <clears throat> so it this is implicit conversion here. And let's not call this, let's say explicitly convert value C to integer with the int modifier, right? Um, so if I do that, that works. Okay. Um, this errors out because um, int cannot be uh, implicitly converted to by a decimal. Now there there are some constraints on that. If I if I have an integer that is bigger than a decimal allows you're not going to be able to do that conversion, right? Take a look back here at the built-in types. There's decimal, there's integer, right? Decimal goes to, um, it has negative 10 to the negative 28th to 10 to the positive 28th. That's a really big number. 
integer. What is that? Um, right, two to the 32nd. It only goes to two billion. So if I try and put a decimal into an integer that's bigger than that, you're going to get an error, right? You can't do that, right? So let me go back down there, right? So if I say not 10, right, it's bigger than 2 billion. So there's a thousand million billion, right? There's trillion. That doesn't work. That's too big, okay? You can't, that's bigger than an integer. You can't stuff it in there, all right? So, you're not allowed to do that interaction. There it goes. So, you can cast, you can force the cast between these different types. And these are the, the built-in types. Eventually, we're going to have our own types. And we're going to want to declare, well, how do you do that implicit conversion? How do I do that explicit conversion? What does that look like? And we're going to be able to define that in our own types later. And we'll, we'll be sure to cover that next time. I need to keep a notepad here of what I'm looking at, what I'm promising I'm going to be talking about next time. You know what I'm saying here, friends? Right? The next time we're doing classes, interfaces, um, operator methods we're going to get into. So, We've only just been, we've assigned things with the equal statement here. What about other operators that you want to do, right? I mean, you can do some of those basic arithmetic operators that you, you kind of expect in, in, your, in your programming language. Hey, hey, uh, that one go away. This one, there we go. So, right, if I have... Um, Right, if I have some initial value, let's not do that. Um, right, so, uh, right, some, maybe it's a number of apples, and it's 100 apples. And if we have another one here, and it's the number of oranges, and maybe it's 150 oranges. Um, well, I can, I can clearly report my apples and oranges by adding them together like that. Okay, fine. Um, right, and I can also say, well, how many more apples do I have than oranges, right? Turn that into a minus. Fine, that works. Um, right, multiply, of course, works, right? Duh. Um, divide is where it gets interesting. That works because we're all integers. But what if this is 30? I've got an integer divided by an integer. The output is an integer. It's not, right, the remainder as a decimal. And this is where you may want to convert things and force it to be a decimal. Because now when I say the divisor is a decimal by putting that M suffix, now I get a, right, and look at this. If I put some parentheses around this and say, give me the type of that, it's a decimal that it output because the divisor is a decimal. It, it takes that type, and that's what it passes through. Dre1865 asks, how long are you going to have these sessions? These are going to be once a week. Um, and, and I've actually got a frequently asked question item here we're going to be doing these regularly monday mornings at 1300 utc 9 a.m eastern 6 a.m pacific right here on the visual studio twitch channel and the recording will be available on the um dot net youtube channel and i'll add a um let's uh, uh edit here um where are the recordings available um, for 14 days after a um, after a stream, they're available on the Twitch channel at uh -huh, Twitch TV Visual Studio videos, and 
will be archived um, on the YouTube channel at uh, youtubecom.net, I believe is where it is. Uh, added uh, links to archive videos. You're gonna make me tap. Fine. There you go. All right, and we'll keep adding out, adding more here. Um, and there's the link. There you go. All right. So. Different things that we can do with the basic arithmetic um, operators, right? Add, subtract, multiply, divide. But there's also there's also a modulus operator that you can use, right? So not only are we dividing, getting three point whatever, but we can also use the percent operator here, and it will give us the remainder, right? Ten. One hundred divided by thirty is right it's three and one third but the remainder is 10 and that modulus operator comes in pretty handy when we want to do things like well is this even or odd right if i mod 100 by 2 right that zero right but of course if this is 101 i get one because right there's one left over when you divide by two. So it's an easy way to tell even or odd. If it's a multiple of some number, it'll come up as zero. That's the modulus operator. Okay, that's fine. Um, you're right, Mr. Smoofy. Um, we should include some links to the actual articles um, in the documentation. Like I, I did for the built-in types up here. And hearing that feedback kind of confirms for me that I should include some of those um, some of those links here. Um, uh, let's add links to the full uh, docs Microsoft.com article. We can do that. And uh, I'll assign that to myself. We'll get that taken care of. That's a fine idea. We'll have that updated and available inside these documents as we build and work with them. I got to keep an eye on my time. I got about 20, 25 minutes left. That's right, Beldathus. You can run .NET on Jupyter. So the, there is a .NET kernel that you can install using the .NET Interactive project. Um, so... So, basic ar arithmetic operators, that's fine. We can also use the double equals operator, right? Equals is the assignment operator. We can use double equals to test if something is equal, right? I can say apples double equals 100, false. It is not 100. It's the Boolean false value returned. Is it 101? Yes, true. I can use the, um, I can use less than, right? Less than and, and those values, right? To further test, I can say less than or equal. Nope, I can use greater than or equal. And I can also use greater than. The does not equal operator is uh, exclamation point equals to get the does not equal. There is no triple equals operator. That doesn't exist. That's not a thing in C-sharp like it is in other programming languages. So, um, now this is doing strictly a value comparison. It's comparing the value of that. There's other things where you can compare references. And that's a different topic about referen how you reference types and how you compare those things. You may want to compare and say, well, is this object equal to the same as that other object. So, don't want to get, don't want to confuse things immediately here. Now, we can also use increment operators. I can say apples plus equals 10. Now, plus equals says, 
add this value and assign it to apples. So 101 plus 10 is going to be 111 and assign that and my value is 111. So it assigns end increments all in one shot. I can do the same with minus and I'll get 91. I'm just now realizing that I should be like duping these off, right? I should be doing something like, um, let's see, uh, put that there, back over here, no, right? Yeah, I, I need, no, not that one, this one. I need semis at the end of this. There it goes. Right. Now, this is actually retaining that value. It added 10 and went from 101 to 111. I took 10 off and now it's down to 101. Okay. You can also multiply. I don't see too many people do the multiply equals, right? But that's absolutely a thing. Right, I mean, that's kind of weird, but can be done. Same thing with divide equals, right? That can be a little strange as well. Um, um, see, I'm trying to divide and assign a decimal value back into the integer. You need to be careful around that. So if I start this off as a decimal up there, well, now it works because I went from, right, 1,010 to 101. If I change this to like three, now I get a funny number there at the end. So these are different ways that you can run and test this. Beldathis with an interesting question. Sure, let's, let's talk about that. And that's something you can certainly experiment with here. Is the decimal 30.0 equal to the integer 30? Let's find out. Right, 30.0 equals 30, right? Is it? Yes. Yes, it is. Now, operators can be overridden and behave differently. Between these two, these are value types, the integer and the decimal. So they know, right, 30.0 right it's it it knows that they can be coalesced they can be coerced that's the word i'm looking for they can be coerced into the same type and those numbers are in fact equal right of, of course if i make this 30.01 it's not but because i've explicitly specified that it is right even if i put an m on the end there it is okay now what might be a little weird is one's a decimal, one's a double, and you can't test across them. Now, if I force this, they are, because we've forced it into the same type. So, right, that's interesting. If I make that a double, it works. So, there's right that that coercion that happens for numbers it works wondering how to get two outputs to display yeah the display method that you have here display command you can wrap it around some c-sharp code and it will display that um, I'm gonna agree with sir Yonston here that that's a good piece of advice here it's a bad idea to compare equality when non-integers are involved because there's limited precision when you get into double and single precision numbers, right? You're going to end up with some digits way at the end that are not quite precise, that it might be a little tricky to interact with. That's why I like to use decimal um, when I ha need to have a fixed number of decimal places. I don't want you to go and have some precision at the end. Eh, I want decimal. I want to be a little bit more precise. Yep, double equals on a floating point number can get a little bit tricky. So if you use decimal, it forces the precision a little bit. So those are some of the simple 
operators, okay? That you can interact with. Now you can extend and build other operators that you could work with, that you could do things with, um, right? Because operators are another object that you can interact with. Now I'm gonna go to my, my show notes here that I forgot to open up and put on a screen and make sure that I got through all of the content that I wanted to today. Uh, not unfiled notes, session notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I did. I think I did get through them. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, gosh. Here we go. Let's get in. There's a couple other types here I wanted to talk about. So we talked about string. Um, let's get into some slightly more complex types because when you look at the built-in types that that ship with the programming language, right? String, numbers, boolean. What about dates? Um, we need to, how do we work with dates or times? So let's work with those here. Um, just call me AD though, before I get to them, has a question. What's the difference between a decimal, double, and a float? So I've got the documentation linked here. I'm gonna open it up. A decimal, double, and a float. So these all point to floating point number, the numeric types, it's the same article. Um, it's a question of precision, right? A floating, um, a floating number has six to nine digits to the right of the decimal place. And it only takes up four bytes. So not as big a deal. And it's stored in a single precision type. A double has 15 to 17 digits, eight bytes. And it's, it, right, we start to lose precision once you get way out there. It's weird, but it's not quite the same, right? Don't use float and double types. In, a, uh, in any kind of financial calculations because you're gonna get some weird numbers when you get way out there towards the end that I'm eh, not quite sure about. Where'd this extra seven appear out about 12 digits? I, I don't know. It's because it's not a precise number. Decimal is a bit more precise and it goes out to 28 to 29 digits. It takes up 16 bytes. So you're you're... You're spending the memory. You're allocating more space in memory to interact with your decimal types, but you end up with better precision. And both of them go positive, negative. You can go all the way to negative values, all the way up to positive values. Hey, the bald bearded builder is here. So, good to see you, my friend. So those are the difference between those. All right. Now, I wanted to talk about dates. Because, right, dates are kind of funny. How, what, how do we do anything um, with dates? So, let's, uh, come here. Uh, yeah, markdown. There we go. Um, date types, right? Um, so, let's, how do we work with date? right so you're now into a dot net type okay so the dot net type for a date is called date time let me just yeah there we go so date time you declare a variable of type date time we'll call this um, um, let's call this today and right if I just want to output well, what's that value the date starts by default in the year one, January 1st, at midnight UTC. Literally the first minute of the first day of the first year. That's the default value. Well, I don't want it to be January 1st of the year one. That's weird. Um, I want it to actually be like, like August 1st, 2020, right? So you allocate a new date time. Here we're gonna introduce the new keyword. 
the new keyword says, make a new one of these objects. And we're gonna pass in arguments to construct it. So I'm gonna specify the year 2020, the month August, and the 1st of August. When I do that, now I have a date that is 2020, August 1st. Okay. Um, what if I need to specify the actual time of day, right? If I want to specify 9 a.m., sure. Ninth hour, zero minutes, zero seconds, and now there it is. Now, no notice it has the Zulu flag here, right? Because you can have a time zone offset indicator after it. Now, without declaring exactly what that indicator, what, what time zone you're working in, it's just assumed to be local time, right? It's, it's just a date out there. When you need to start working with time zones, there's all kinds of interactions that you can get into and work with. And we're not going to dive down into date theory, but I want to show you how you can get a date to interact with. Um, Zulu is the radio character, the radio call for the Z, um, for the, the Z character. So every now and again, you'll hear me use the, the radio characters for them. So how's it going, Eagle Hansen? Good to see you. Right, I'll, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, you'll hear me go into those sometimes. Um... And, and sometimes I, I mix up the alphabets, right? I'll go between radio and, um, and and the FAA standard ones back and forth. So, okay. So what if I want to get the time of day out of that? Sure. There's a time of day. Is it method or property? I think it's a yeah, time of day property on your date that you can interact with. And we reference the properties of objects by putting dot in the property name. So today dot time of day, and it gives me 9 a.m. because that's what we created. 9 a.m. was the time of day we allocated. I can also get other parts of it like the month. It's the eighth month, it's August, right? Whatever, and you can do these interactions and the type ahead, the in, in, in some, the type ahead will help you with this on your various editors. In Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, we have something called IntelliSense that you can that you can use that will automatically tell you all the various features of the variables and interactions you have. There should be something like now. Yep, IntelliSense, here we go. That's right to get the current time. You better believe we got now. That's a great point, Physitronic. So if I specify just date time dot now, it reports the current time. So here, my local time, it's 1050 on the 10th of August. Well, what if I want to get that in UTC? I can put UTC now, and it gives me the UTC time. So these are the things that you can use to interact and get the time, the exact time that you execute that method. It's the exact time down to the second. There are other ways to get interactions and get, get timings down to the millisecond, even the processor tick. And we'll talk about that another time. But I can, right, I can, once I have now, right, I've got those same properties because it's just another day that I can interact with like day month year hour right maybe I want something to only run during right um, during the 11 o'clock hour okay if the if date time now hour is 11 do this right maybe you want to build a schedule application and you want to inspect the now hour and do something only this often Go for it. There you go. Those are the ways that you can do that. Uh, do that interaction. Physitronic with a very good question here as we tiptoe into the topic of time zones. Um, is there already built-in conversions for time zones? Like if you want to go two time zones from your current one or something like that? Yes. Yep. There, there are time zone objects available for you. It's a little bit further down, down the path on date time math. 
than I want to get into today, but you can absolutely work with time zones. Um, and the way you reference time zones differs whether you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux. On Windows, I would refer to Eastern Time, and I, w I would actually reference the, the text Eastern Time to get that time zone, where if I was on a Linux machine, I would reference America's slash New York to get the Eastern Time Zone. So it's a little bit different depending on what, what machine you're on, and some of that interaction makes the, the, being able to support different machines and do that that system level interaction something that you need to um, be able to handle in your code so we'll save machine and operating specific operating system specific considerations later now you're getting how everything is an object in C sharp that's right John Skeet has written some amazing material on his blog about dates and times. You're right. You're right. Um, now, right, I can display the hour. But what if I what if I want to take date time? Let me change that back to uh, today. Um, date time dot now. Display the current time on current local time uh just the current local time we'll say that okay if i want to add hours right if i want to take that or, or some other math right if i want to take today and i want to i can add days right let's say well let's add a week to that add seven days right um no 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 not that's what I wanted. There we go. So now I added seven days, and I've got uh, the tenth from the ten. Oh, wait a sec. I got confused because they were in the wrong order. Display the hour for today, the nine a.m. Um, now is the tenth, and now here today add days. So today was August first. It's now August eighth when I add those days. Okay. You're working on a project with Python and dates, and the upper limit is the year 3001. What's the upper limit in C Sharp? So just like there's a date time now, there is a date time max value as well. And it's the year 9999 and December 31st and one second before midnight turning over to the year 10,000 so um, add a week to the today to um, August 1 okay now I can also create something called a time span and a time span is a unit of time, right? It's not a specific date, but it's a it's a it's a way to reference and say like three hours, right? So we can create we can say right time span. Um, let's call it three hours equals new right. I could say new time span, and I forget what the constructor is here, and it's not it's not going to. Uh, Give me the intel sense to complete that i can kind of cheat because there's a time span from hours method that i can call and specify three and it'll show me three hours now now that i have three hours now i can i can add that unit of time that three hours to my date, right? So I can say today dot add. I'm not adding, right? I don't know exactly what three hours is, right? It might be coming from somewhere else, but I could say today add three hours and I get the full today and it comes out to noon, all right? 
So it's a it's a unit of time. It's a yeah, it's a delta. It's right a collection of time. It's a way for you to reference some right some number of hours, minutes, seconds, days, years, whatever. Right, but you are referencing some duration effectively is what a time span is. All right. We've gone through a lot here. We are wrapping up because we have just a few minutes left. Um, Physitronic has a, has a good question here. Has the today object changed after add? No, because we didn't assign it back to today. See? It's still the same value. If we had done... Um, Right, if we had taken this, uh, put it here, and if we had said today equals, uh, there we go. Right, so there it is, and it's the same value because we, you can't see it. So there's my three hours. There's today add three hours and assign it back into today. And there's the result so good question let me just pop that back in there get rid of that there we go i'm going to save this notebook and i'm going to head over to my console this is c sharp with c sharp fritz i'm going to commit these changes um and we can clear that out and we're going to wrap up here um, completed talking about uh, dates and converting types uh, needs some text and I need to sign my code here we go I have a YubiKey that I use to sign that and I'll push out those changes and that will be available in the show repository right here and I'll get a I'll get a robot running and available here there's a link if you want to get out to the github repository but I will I will trim out the rest of this notebook with a little bit more text to describe what's going on and show some of these examples I like the suggestion of adding some links out to the official Microsoft documentation. And I also liked having about the first half of this scripted and, and leaving the second half unscripted and answering your questions and, and going through here and addressing some of the things that you want to learn about as we go through and talk about the various topics. This video, like all the videos in this series, will be available over on the .NET YouTube channel. And let's get ready to wrap things up here today. That's right, Isaga. Inside, internally, date, time, and time span are represented as ticks, as processor ticks. And, right, that has a reference from the beginning of time that the processor knows about to whenever it is that you're, you're indicating there. All right. Oh, thank you, Just Call Me AD. Appreciate the kind words. Really appreciate you joining us here on the Visual Studio channel. This this video will be archived over on the YouTube, um, and we're all the code that we wrote and all of all of the questions that we had, we're gonna have loaded up and and I'm gonna have out on the GitHub repository. I hope you check that out. I hope you subscribe to the .NET channel out on YouTube, um, because that will be loaded up with content from here. There's a link. Yep, we'll have a we'll be doing um, classes, interfaces, and operator methods next time. But every Monday morning, you'll find me here talking about and getting you started with the basics of C sharp. If you're interested in, in a complete AMA, everything's crazy off the hook. Um, join me on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays over on my channel, C sharp Fritz, here on Twitch, and um, everything goes there. You can ask any question. Happy to answer them. Um, and right now we're working on a Blazor project, building a web application with Blazor. 